These movies don't need any introduction. You guys already know what they're all about. We're doing another series review. Yes! Hell yeah! Hey, come on, baby! Come on! Yes! Come on! Ah! And boy howdy, are these a good one. So, let's batten down the hatches and get right into this. And remember, if you scallywags don't subscribe, you're gonna walk the plank. Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Ooh, buddy. This movie's phenomenal. I think it's single-handedly changed how people view pirates in media. You know, in the past, pirates were always stereotypical swashbucklers or just kid-friendly. You know, think like Peter Pan or the Goonies. You know, you see them at your birthday party. In modern times, we get more Captain Phillips kind of pirates. But Curse of the Black Pearl, they gave us the real deal. These pirates murder, rape, pillage, and burn. They're ruthless, gross, and they really make you feel like they're real pirates. And pretty much everything you want in an action-adventure movie is here. Comedy, action, dialogue, and for once, a genuinely compelling plot. But the greatest thing for me in this movie is the characters. Each of them feel like they matter. Even the ones in the background are the side characters. Nothing feels out of place. Let's take Elizabeth, for example. She's not just some damsel in distress, although sometimes she is, granted. But she stands up for herself, deceives others, and always tries to stand her ground. Will is like a boy scout in this. He's always trying to do the right thing, but ends up fucking up plans or getting looked down on. That's not good enough! Mr. Turner, you're not a military man. You're not a sailor. And with the plot revolving around him, it's nice to see him come into his own at the end, into a leadership role, and stand up for himself. And between the two of them, we get an actually good subplot that doesn't feel forced. Oh my god, they did it. How did they do it? How did they do it? Seriously, they made Will and Elizabeth's relationship compelling. How many times must I ask you to call me Elizabeth? At least once more, Miss One. Good day, Mr. Turner. Plus, with the addition of Norrington, it makes the payoff at the end that much better. And speaking of Norrington, yes, I know he's creepy, you know, he knew Elizabeth as a child and wants to marry her, but the man is underrated. He's not so much a villain in this as he's more of a grounded character. Pirate or not, this man saved my life. One good deed is not enough to redeem a man of a lifetime of wickedness. So it seems enough to condemn him. His lawfulness balances out the unlawfulness in the world around him, and he provides the audience with something to relate to, law and order. Plus, he accepts Elizabeth's decision at the end to be with Will after she already agreed to marry him, so he basically got swindled. And he lets Jack go. You know, his story gets a lot more sad as the franchise continues, and we'll get to that, but underrated character. As for the man of the hour, how could you not love Jack Sparrow? His intro's awesome, it perfectly sets up his character, it shows a goofiness, but how everything works out for him in the end. And the big thing is that he's not the main focus of the movie. He is definitely a main character, and it's who people think of when they hear pirate, but he doesn't get all the screen time, which is why I think the later movies weren't as good. In Curse of the Black Pearl, he's more of an equal with Will and Elizabeth and Barbosa. It's all a balancing act, no characters on screen longer than they need to be, which I think is important in this. This is either madness or brilliance. It's remarkable how often those two traits coincide. And Jeffrey Rush as Barbosa is too fantastic. If you ask me, he's exactly what a pirate is. Everything from how he looks to how he talks, he's crude, cunning, and just overall gross to look at. It's perfect. I'm curious, after killing me, what is it you're planning on doing next? <gasps> Another thing I like about this movie is how realistic it is. It's basically what I said about Raiders of the Lost Ark in my Indiana Jones review. Yes, there is an undead crew who turns to skeletons in the moonlight, 
However, it makes sense within the context of the movie. It just feels grounded and takes itself seriously. For example, Jack didn't magically get off the island when he was marooned there. He got drunk until Run Runners came and took him aboard their ship. And looking at the curse that affects Barbosa's crew, you really start to feel bad for them. They're constantly in a state of dying but are never being relieved by death. You're constantly starving but can't eat, dying of thirst but can't drink to relieve it. And as we find out in the next movie with Bootstrap, even at the bottom of the ocean, where the pressure is crushing you and you can't breathe, you just live like that forever. It's not only terrifying to think about, but it feels plausible. And that's what makes it realistic. When there's explanations as to why things are happening and how they're happening, then the audience has an easier time accepting that as a true fact. You know, it's like watching Harry Potter. You don't watch Harry Potter and think, oh, wow, this is so unrealistic. They're doing magic. It's like, yeah, everything is magical, but it's all explained and makes sense with each other. There's rules. You can't just do anything because then the audience wouldn't believe it. And that's how the curse feels in Curse of the Black Pearl. In my mind, this is the most cinematic and perfect movie of the franchise. It works as a standalone film and it wraps up nicely. We have Jack getting his one shot off on Barbosa, Will and Elizabeth ending up together, and Norrington learning that just because someone's a pirate, it doesn't mean that they're a bad person, which gets perfectly summarized by Governor Swan. Perhaps on the rare occasion, pursuing the right course demands an act of piracy. Piracy itself can be the right course. This movie was meant to be a one-off summer blockbuster, but due to its success, they expanded into an entire series. And honestly, I think without the other movies, this one is still great. Plus, the ending with Jack gives me chills every time I watch it. And really bad eggs. Drink up, me hearty show ho so I have to give it like 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, whatever. It's a fantastic movie. But I wonder if there's any other movie that could beat it. It's so rare for a movie to have a great sequel, let alone one that's almost better in every way, at least in my opinion. This is the pinnacle of not just the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, but of any pirate-related content and media. Admittedly, the opening is not as iconic as Curse of the Black Pearl, or the reveal of Jack Sparrow, but it still holds its own. The Turkish prison that they show is absolutely terrifying. The best part about this movie is the build-up to Davy Jones. We get snippets of information or mentions of his name, but nothing's revealed yet. Like at the beginning when Bootstrap Bill visits Jack and he tells him he must keep his end of the deal with Jones. It's just a mention of his name. Or we see the crack and destroy ships before finally seeing its tentacles. Or having Davy Jones revealed by casting judgment on those dying. It was such a badass scene. Even in Curse of the Black Pearl we heard mentions of his name. <laughs> Life is cruel. Why should the afterlife be any different? And the build-up works so well because we as the audience are told the tales of Jones and his legendary crew and ship. It's badass seeing the Dutchman emerge from the ocean or sink back down. But the most impressive thing about any of these movies is the CGI because it still holds up today which is insane to think about. Seriously, how does a movie from 2006 look better than ones that come out today? Just look at Davy Jones. This is what care looks like. This is what happens when you give your artist enough time to work on something. You know, it doesn't turn into these monstrosities. And for me, the fish crew really makes the movie. Visually, like I said, they're all stunning. But not only does Davy Jones look real, he's also one of the most compelling villains in the series. Price. His deal with Sparrow is daunting as the Kraken is following close by. But we also know that he abandoned his post-faring souls of those who died at sea in the afterlife. And I don't know about you, but Calypso is great. Naomi Harris is one of my favorite actors in this movie, and she does an amazing job playing her. But their story is mostly for the next movie. I also like how you can see Jones hold his hat with his tentacles when the Dutchman submerges underwater. I just thought that was neat. 
And talking more on the villains, let's not forget Beckett, who pretty much is the main antagonist for this movie and the next one. At least with Jones, we get some hints of emotion, regret, and a reason for why he turned out the way he is. Beckett is just a stone cold badass. Just no feelings at all like Norrington or tragic past like Jones. He's just a power hungry murderous man who's gonna do whatever it takes. And if you stand in his way, well, you're done. And for someone with little or no backstory, it's crazy to think that he could be so well remembered. And I think that's what makes him great is that he doesn't fear anything. He's always in control, for the most part, and he plays into the game of pirates. He's basically just a legal pirate in the eyes of the law. A lawful evil character, if you will. This warrant is for Elizabeth Swan. How is this? That's annoying. My mistake. Arrest her. But it's not just Jones or Beckett that helped carry the movie, though he is the drawing point for me. We also have Jack and the crew on the island of cannibals, seeing them escape from the bone cages while Jack parkours around without his hands or the fight scene on Isla Cruces and the spinning water wheel. Also the build up to the fight at the end with Jack getting trapped on board and the Kraken attack paying off so well. And there's also some smaller side stories like Norrington being a broken man trying to get back to his honorable position. And you kind of root for him during the film. And that's what I was talking about in the last movie. He really starts to grow on you. You see him at his lowest point as he tries desperately to claw his way back to the top. As for other characters, Elizabeth becomes more of that deceptive woman who can stand on her own that we saw glimpses of in the last movie. I'm here to find the man I love. I'm deeply flattered, son, but my first and only love is the sea. Will's relationship with his father, Bootstrap, is compelling, and you get some great scenes with Jack, Will, and Norrington fighting for their own reasons. And each reason is just as understandable as the last. Norrington wants his position back, Jack wants the Kraken off of him, and Will wants to save his father. So you kind of got to pick a side and root for someone. And there's no parts of this movie where I'm bored or uninterested in the conflicts. And that's why I watch these movies, is because they're entertaining. I do like the story, mainly of the first three, but it's an action comedy that goes above and beyond expectations. I will admit that the plot is not as solid as Curse of the Black Pearl, it definitely starts leaning more towards the action blockbuster type, and I think it's the start of bloated movies in the series. Not that I think it's bloated, but you can definitely see small glimpses of it looking back knowing how the other movies are. The reason I like this movie so much is because, like I said, it's just entertaining. I don't think that just because a movie is a blockbuster means that it's inherently low quality or has a poor story. As we saw with Curse of the Black Pearl, you can have a genuinely good plot, characters, and everything else in between. Also, while the ending isn't as iconic as Curse of the Black Pearl, What's become of my ship? <laughs> it really gets you hyped for the next installment. I know some people have problems with the movie, but I love it, so I'm going to give it like the same as Curse of the Black Pearl. A nice 9.5 out of 10. Doesn't quite get a 10 out of 10, but I love it. This is where things start to get a little muddy. I love these first three movies a lot, as you can tell, but At World's End is needlessly confusing. Because in terms of entertainment, it's on par with the other two. I mean, the final battle alone, at the end where the ships are blasting cannons at each other, people sword fighting, swinging around, all circling a maelstrom during a lightning storm, it's badass, there's no other way to put it. But when it comes to the plot, it's not that it's hard to follow. And I know there's going to be someone who's like, oh well, if you just watch it five times and pay attention, it's really not that hard to understand. You're a liar! You're a liar! It's not that at all. The character motivations are clear in this, it's just that they're constantly backstabbing and deceiving one another, and I don't think a movie that makes you think is bad, I quite like them, but you do have to follow the movie like, okay wait, so this person betrayed this person, so they can do this, but how does this affect their relationship with this other person? And wait, why did they go against them? You just have to backtrack so much during the film that it takes away from what's going on in the present. To be fair though, I do have to give credit where credit is due. This is an incredibly ambitious film, and I can tell that they really tried. The production design, uh, cinematography, music, 
the locations they use, like Davy Jones Locker, Singapore. It's all incredible, and you can tell that a lot of passion went behind it. And you can tell they were trying to do something new. They wanted to take pirates in a new, bigger direction. So I'll always give credit for trying something new. I mean, just looking at the next two movies after this, they feel incredibly lazy compared to At World's End. Or even look at Marvel now, how they're just constantly putting out the same exact thing every time. Or uh, <clears throat> one of my least favorite movies that I think was just a lazy copy of the original. No, this one has the ball to try something new. For one, they tried expanding the world of pirates. They wanted to show that everything is not just revolving around Jack, Will, and Elizabeth. No, there's a huge world out there filled with other crews and captains and what have you. And two, I commend them on their attempt to try to capture things like Davy Jones' locker. How do you capture purgatory? Well, I don't care for things like little Jack Sparrows on the real Jack Sparrow's shoulders talking to him in his ear. I think it's a little silly. I do like Jack hallucinating himself and seeing tons of other people as his crew, as he's going insane there. Another thing is that this movie is dark. Hell, this one starts out with the British government executing a child. I mean, is Disney ever going to do that again? There's no way they do that. It's also darker in the sense that they up the disgusting factor in this movie. I mean, it seems that the makeup department had full control over this one. People look like pirates. They're covered in dirt, sweat, have vile rotting teeth. I and mean, just look when they go to Singapore, how like dirty everything is. And that, that's called immersion. I don't think this one's as memorable as the previous two movies, but it does have its moments. Like I said before, Sparrow and Davy Jones' locker, the lost souls drifting at sea, Jones and Calypso, the final battle sequence, and Will becoming the caption of the Flying Dutchman. It's also hilarious to see Davy Jones have to stand in the bucket of water during the meeting on the beach because he can't step on dry land. <laughs> also, Norrington's death as he saves Elizabeth. You didn't think you would like him in the first one, but by the third movie, you're crying over him. Also, I don't know how controversial this is, but I don't like the Pirate Council. I felt it was out of place. The location was stunning, all the crashed ships piled up on top of each other, but it just seemed weird that there's a pirate council, and like they meet and discuss things, I don't know, it's just, and like Jack's dad was there, and I have to add that Lord Beckett's death was probably one of the best death sequences in all of cinematic history. Him walking down slowly, getting blasted with cannons, not caring about a thing, it's so awesome. Calypso growing gigantic and then turning into a bunch of crabs was pretty funny as it was ridiculous. I understand why they put it into the movie, but it's just like, it doesn't really work for me. I definitely don't hate this movie, I just think it's more controversial than the other two, and miles better than the next two. So it's kind of the awkward middle child in that respect. I know there's people out there whose favorite movie in the franchise is At World's End, which I can understand that. It's just not for me, but on an entertainment factor, it's definitely on par with the other two. I love watching the movie, just sitting back and relaxing. If you don't focus too much on the plot and just want to sit back to the soundtrack and watch some fights going on, this movie's perfect. So I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. I think that's a good spot. Now onto the second most popular Pirates movie, as far as the box office is concerned. Almost beating out Dead Man's Chest. This one's strange. This movie feels like they needed to come up with something to make money. And we're just like, hey, let's just Google some history about Pirates and do a 5 minute Wikipedia read before writing the script. The events of the trilogy were wrapped up and everything was perfect. And the changes they made are seen instantly. People look cleaner, there's extras everywhere, and the budget was sky high. On Stranger Tides is one of the most expensive movies ever made, which is bizarre to think about. $380 million for this movie. 
Now, I don't hate it, but it just feels off after coming from the first three. Blackbeard is a decent antagonist, but they never really go anywhere with his character, and then he just kind of dies. So yeah. The search for the Fountain of Youth is cool, but the only memorable thing for me are the mermaids. Blackbeard's also already a famous pirate, so I don't think it counts that people remember him. I think Ian McShane did a good job with the character, but you can't fix a bad script like that. Remember when I said that in Curse of the Black Pearl, Jack Sparrow was on more equal footing with the rest of the cast? Well, they threw that away. He's the main focus of the movie now. And in this one, the main problems with this movie, and the next one, is that it went from Pirates of the Caribbean to Jack Sparrow's shenanigans in the Caribbean. The lack of Will and Elizabeth is apparent. They contributed to the overall feeling of the story, and I think the writers didn't believe the removal would cause any issues. The thinking behind it was something like, well, Will and Elizabeth's story is over, but people only like Jack Sparrow, so let's make a blockbuster that just focuses on him. And no amount of Jeffrey Rush's Barbosa can save this movie. Oh wait, he's barely even Barbosa anymore. What the fuck is that? Look how they massacred my boy. The sense of groundedness is completely gone. This is mostly due to Blackbeard. If done correctly, he could be a very cool villain, but it just seems so off in this. He has magic that can control his ship and voodoo dolls, and look, undead crew members. Wonder where we've seen that before. And I've been judging a lot of these movies based on their entertainment factor, and this one is barely entertaining. As I said, the mermaids I thought were cool, but there were some moments where the pacing seemed completely off, like in the middle of the quest or journey, Blackbeard stops everything and puts together this absurd game of Russian roulette. And what amounts to this moment? Um, nothing. Literally nothing. It's just people arguing back and forth, and then Jack jumps off the cliff, which they could have just done right at the beginning. One part that I did think was hilarious was how the whole movie's building up to the Fountain of Youth, and then we see it for like five minutes until the Spanish walk in and just destroy it and leave. It, it was so funny, like they just destroy it and then just like, alright, bye. And you start thinking, like, what was even the point of this movie? And what did they spend all that money on? There's no impressive set pieces except maybe the Fountain of Youth. There's no sea combat at all. The whole story is basically just on land. And if it's going to be a standalone movie, do something crazy, go wild. Don't just have them go on a treasure hunt that amounts to nothing. Even if you don't care about the story, the action is just missing from this one. They care more about Philip and his damn mermaid than they do giving a great action sequence. I can understand why some people like this movie and enjoy it. It's definitely not terrible. I think there's a certain mood I need to be in to watch it. I can go without it and usually just watch the trilogy. So I'm going to give it like a 5, 6 out of 10. It's nothing really special. I could take it or leave it, to be honest. I want one of those. With as many problems with On Stranger Tides that I have, I could honestly overlook all of them in comparison with this movie. I'm not sure what they were thinking when they made this, but the movie feels like if you explain to a toddler what Pirates of the Caribbean was, and then had them come up with a story. Because now it's marketed specifically for children. Everything in here is just to get a cheap laugh or to make it worth the ticket price. Oh, spaghetti rolls! I don't even know where to begin with this movie. I mean, I guess we can start with Jack, because some people say this movie got back to the roots of the franchise, and I couldn't disagree more with that. They butchered one of the most iconic protagonists in cinema, and doing so takes away from the entire feeling and point of Pirates of the Caribbean, because he's no longer Jack Sparrow. He's no longer a witty character who has charm, personality, and some intelligence to a degree. No, he's just a buffoon now who's there for a joke. Seriously, they made him into a drunk idiot, and for what exactly? The plot? For laughs? I, I don't know. But ever since Jack became the main character of the franchise, they completely destroyed his character. 
They also have him pulling these ridiculous stunts. The first 20 minutes in, we have the crew Tokyo drifting a literal building around town. They pulled the building off its foundation and drove it. Or when Jack is on the guillotine and it's spinning around, almost chopping his head off. But oh no, it's not quite there yet because we got to keep him. He's the main character. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? We also have another Will and Elizabeth stand in again. Although we see Will at the beginning. You know, help sending up the plot, and it's so poorly acted. Henry, what have you done? I said I'd find you. Look at me, son. Here's the thing. I know people will be like, oh, well, there's always going to be a Will and Elizabeth stand in if you look at it that way. And I get it. There needs to be other side characters, and to a point, I can forget that. You know, it's not as bad as the mermaid story from the last one. I don't really care for the whole Karina is Barbosa's daughter storyline and Barbosa's death at the end, which I think was completely unnecessary. I don't mind as much Will and Henry's story, even though it does take away from the ending of At World's End. At least there's some resemblance of Will and Bootstrap story from the original trilogy. However, what I can't forgive is the villain. We have fucking Salazar Slytherin over here who just loves saying Jack's name. Jack Sparrow. He's Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow. Jack the Sparrow. Oh, yay, and another undead crew. I wonder where we've seen that before. I do love the CGI with him, seeing the floating effect like they're still drowning and them running on the water. But can we get something new? And the worst part is that they gave him a backstory with Jack Sparrow and showed it on camera. Can we stop with character backstories like these? They're almost never good. I said the same thing about the Last Crusade opening, and it's the same thing here. But I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to give an example. Let's look at Batman. Batman's backstory makes sense because it gives context for why he is the way he is. Bruce Wayne's parents getting murdered in front of him is a central plot point to the character. Not only does it set him up to be Batman, but it gives him characteristics like his no-killing rule. It's a traumatic experience that shaped Bruce Wayne into who he is today and it plays a role into how people perceive him. Who's the real Bruce Wayne? Is it when he has the mask on? And that's how a character backstory should be. It shouldn't be, hey kid, you ever want to know how Jack Sparrow hoodwinked a guy and killed him and got all these knickknacks? Or you want to know how Indiana Jones got his hat and why he's afraid of snakes? It's all a bunch of fan service. At least The Last Crusade sets up Indy and his father, but Dead Men Tells No Tales doesn't do any of that. I saw this movie in theaters when it first came out, and it was one of the first movies that I ever fell asleep to. When they add things in like Jack Sparrow getting married, it seems like they don't know where to take the story, and they're just adding things just for the sake of it. I mean, there's the end battle with the trident and everything, but it's, it's nothing special. I think it says something when I remember the end credits scene more than the rest of the movie. If I had to sum up this movie in one sentence, it would be... Jack Sparrow using an undead zombie shark as a getaway driver. And that's pretty much it. So I'm giving this movie like a 3 out of 10. I don't really ever want to watch it again. And a pirate! There's a witch and a pirate in my shop! Well, it's your lucky day! Have either of the four of you seen my bank? But that's all I got for now. So tell me what you thought about my review. What's your favorite Pirates of the Caribbean movie? What would you rank them? And if you like this video, please subscribe, like, comment, and I'll see you guys in the next one.